I, I want to welcome all of you to the virtual Pasadena Senior Center and today's special presentation about the birds of San Diego County and Southern California. I'm Annie Lasky, the Director of Events. I'm also a big fan of backyard bird watching, so I'm particularly delighted to help bring you today's program. Uh, the Pasadena Senior Center, as uh, most of you, I believe, know, is a recreation and resource center. We were founded in 1960. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit organization that is donor and member supported. We really appreciate everyone's support, especially at this time when our facilities remain closed and we work to engage the community online. I encourage all of you to check out the many virtual classes and programs we have scheduled and to just, you know, think about the many, the, all, the, all the great stuff we have, the programs. If you are not already on our weekly email list that uh, tells you the upcoming programs, I encourage you to sign up for that, www.pasadenaseniorcenter.org. I expect most of you actually heard about this program uh, through that. Uh, one of the questions that I was uh, asked earlier was, uh, you know, what uh, do you have something on every Thursday? And I will say that we have things most Thursdays. Uh, and just a real brief next week coming up, we have a documentary filmmaker who made a film on the restoration of the Rose Garden Arbor at the Huntington Library. Uh, he's a wonderful photographer and a really wonderful speaker. So please uh, join uh, me and Michael Stern and learn about the Faux Bois Arbor at the Huntington. Uh, in February, the first Thursday in February will be a celebration of Valentine's Day with uh, lecturer Eleanor Sh uh, Schrader talking about the history of Valentine's Day. We then, let's see, we have Bob and Don, our musical duo, will be back with Rogers and Hammerstein, and that's really exciting to anybody who's ever seen one of their shows. Uh, the third Thursday will be a celebration of Chinese New Year, and we'll talk about the history, the traditions, the foods, the dragon, and uh, many of you may know uh, Irene, who was a Tai Chi instructor for us uh, for many years, she'll be our co-host. And then the last weekend, I the last weekend, the last Thursday in February, uh, in honor of Black History Month, we'll be having a conversation with uh, June Carroll, who is just an amazing woman. She's an actress, a playwright, and uh, just an all around fascinating person. And uh, we'll be talking with her about her career as an African-American woman and what, what her influences have been. And she's amazing. You, you won't wanna miss any of our programs basically. So join us Thursday for all of those things. So quickly housekeeping tips. Uh, we will keep everybody muted uh, without the possibility of uh, being unmuted until the end of the program when we'll take a Q&A and we'll be able to unmute you and you can ask questions of our wonderful speaker, who now finally I will introduce. So Dr. Philip Pride is Professor Emeritus at San Diego State University, where he taught courses in environmental policy for 32 years. His specialties are water resources, energy resources, land use planning, and environmental impact analysis. In the community, he served as chair of the San Diego Planning Commission and was on the board of directors of the County Water Authority. He currently serves on the board of directors for San Diego River Park Foundation and the Anza Borrego Foundation. He has authored six books, has been a Fulbright research scholar and is the recipient of a National Distinguished Teaching Award. He's the editor and primary author of San Diego and Introduction to the Region, now in its fifth edition. Phil is a frequent lecturer on a variety of topics, including renewable, issue, renewable energy, Russia, birds, Antarctica, and climate change. So uh, with no further ado, let me uh, remove my spotlight and spotlight our speaker. Let's see, get, get him on here. There we go, spotlight. Okay, <laughs> welcome Phil uh, and take it away. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. 
Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. I think this is the first time I've given this show outside of San Diego. So I'll start off with a minor apology. The name on the first slide will be the birds of San Diego. But as I'm sure many of you probably already know, uh, the birds in the Los Angeles, Pasadena area are not going to be much different from the birds in San Diego. So the, the show will be uh, totally valid, e even though uh, the title is going to be uh, a bit misleading. Um, what you may not know in that regard, though, having just um, mentioned LA and San Diego, uh, there are two counties in the United States that are sort of in a tie, slight, almost a tie, for having the most birds having been seen and identified within that county of all the counties, and there's over 3,000 counties in the US, of all those counties there are two that have seen the most. Want to guess what two of those are? You got it, San Diego and Los Angeles. And the reason is where both counties are on the Pacific Flyway, both counties are on the ocean, uh, both counties have a wide variety of uh, environmental uh, habitats and so forth that the birds can make use of from mountains to desert to ocean and everything in between. So uh, I cannot uh, help, however, but note that at the moment, I believe San Diego is about one or two species ahead of Los Angeles County at, the, at this time, but it does go back and forth. And uh, now I'll let you guess in your minds uh, what the number is of birds that have been seen in both counties roughly. And uh, it may shock you if, you, if you're guessing a number, I'd advise you to immediately at least double it probably. Uh, the number is well over 500 for both counties, number of species seen in the counties. Now, of course, not all those are regular. Uh, in fact, most of them are oddball things that have shown up at some point over the last several years. But I, I thought you would like that, to, to know that at least. Um, for those of you who are uh, I'm assuming that probably I have as the audience people that are both somewhat experienced with birding maybe, and others who are just ranked beginners. So just a couple of words for those who are ranked beginners. Uh, first of all, you're in very good company uh, because uh, the somebody, I forget who, did a poll a few years back as to what forms of recreation were the fastest growing forms of recreation, that included everything from bicycling to tennis to softball or whatever. And the form of recreation that was growing the fastest, not the one that had the most people right now, but the one growing uh, each year by the fastest amount, fastest percentage, was birding. Uh, that was the fastest growing. So there are more and more of you coming along all the time. So if any of you are um, just beginning, I'll just give you some very quickly a, a couple of things to know, and they're, they're very simple. Uh, one reason birding is popular is you only need really two things a good pair of binoculars, and uh, some kind of field guide. And if you're interested in learning more about the birds, uh, maybe you will be after this show, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, I'll give you the name of, uh, you go to any bookstore or Amazon uh, and order the, the, a good bird guide. The two that are most popular and most commonly used is one by a gentleman named David Sibley, S-I-B-L-E-Y. And I'm sure that his books will be in any bookstore. And uh, like Barnes and Noble, you know, any big bookstore or Amazon. And the other commonly used book, which is a little smaller and a little easier probably for a beginner, is just put out by the National Geographic Society. And I think that one just says National Geographic Society on the cover. So those would be my recommendation. If you don't have a bird book and you want one that will last you for years and years and pretty much uh, help you find the birds pretty well, uh, one of those two. And uh, I just want to mention one other thing, and this now is more for any birders that might be a little more experienced, but I think anybody will uh, really appreciate it and really be amazed by it. It has just come out last fall, I think late last fall, so it's only been out like two or three months. And it's also by the same fellow I just mentioned, David Sibley. And I'll see if I can hold it up here, see if that will work. Can everybody see this? Yeah, they're nodding, okay. It's called, uh, What's It Like to, to Be a Bird? not a birder, a bird. And what it does is the, the field guides usually tell you uh, what a bird looks like and other identifying characteristics and where it's found. This book is, is just amazing. It really does tell you everything you could ever possibly want to know about a bird, how it lives, how it breeds, how it feeds, uh, why this, why that. It answers all your questions. It gets rid of some uh, myths that have been around for a long time, but 
Like one myth is that birds can't smell. In fact, they can smell very well. And he goes through all that and uh, tells you some other uh, very, very interesting things for, for every bird. And it's, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not every bird. What he's done is he's taken the very various families of birds, like wrens or egrets or swallows or whatever, and then just picks out usually just one, sometimes two or three birds in that uh, family and tells you lots and lots and lots of things about them. And so uh, I kind of recommend this book. I don't know how much it costs. It's probably not all that cheap, but it's a really good. There are lots of books out about birds. This is by far the best one I've ever seen. And just to give you an idea of what you can learn in this, I'll just give you one quote from the book. You've heard the expression to eat like a bird. Uh, if you've heard that expression, you know that it means uh, to not eat much. Well, okay, here's the direct quote from Sibley. Quote, if you ate like a bird, you might need to eat more than 25 large pizzas a day. That's how much birds eat. When a bird is starting its migration and it, it fattens up because some of them have to fly a long ways across water and uh, some of them will, put, uh, will eat before they take off over the water. They will eat an amount of food equal to 50% of their own weight. So if you weigh 140 pounds, that would be a, a 70 pound meal <laughs> before you start flying. <laughs> And by the way, we learned how to make airplanes and fly them by looking at bird's wings. For 3,000 years, people tried to figure out how to fly like a bird, so they jump off a cliff with something on their shoulders that looked like a wing, and that never ended well. Until finally, they realized in the latter part of the 19th century that it wasn't the wing itself, it was the shape of the wing, the cross-sectional shape. It's called an airfoil. And that airfoil shape is the reason birds could fly, because it gives them the lift. When they flap their wings, they're mainly, that's mainly to gain speed. It's just like you running. <laughs> Start running faster, your goal is to gain speed. They flap their wings to gain speed mostly. But to get up in the air, when you see a bird circling around in the air, uh, he's making use of that airfoil shape of their wings. Okay, enough yakking and on with the slideshow. I'm going to try and leave. Um, I'm supposed to leave, I think I said leave 15 minutes. Uh, I know me. <laughs> And so if you get 10 minutes, you're going to be lucky, but I'll try to leave at least 10 minutes for questions and answers. Well, we can always, uh, we can stay as long as you can stay, Phil. So after you've finished your presentation, we can continue Q&A. You don't want to say what you just said, because I can stay easily talking about birds till after midnight. So Okay, you have 50 <laughs> minutes to talk about birds. <laughs> I, I like to start, particularly for beginning birders, by emphasizing that both here and in L.A., uh, there are three categories in the county, uh, permanent residents, birds, which means birds that are here year round, uh, winter vis visitors that come in for the winter, uh, which is the middle bird, white crown sparrow, and then the migratory birds that come in to breed here, and that would be uh, the black-headed grosbeak on the right-hand side, and I'll be talking about all three as we, we go along. I didn't want to confuse you too much, but there's also really a fourth variety, and that is birds that migrate spring and fall but don't stay. They're just migrating through uh, to get somewhere further north to breed in the spring or migrating through to get to Mexico or somewhere in the fall. So there's really a fourth category, but there aren't too many in that category. Okay, now fun time, which thing will, oh, that's not gonna do it. That will do it, okay. I'm moving it just for your information anyway, by uh, using my uh, mouse. Don't ask me why. <laughs> so here are the permanent residents. Um, this is a, a scrub jay, and uh, it's a very common bird, and this uh, poor guy has had his name changed, not that he cares, uh, his name is basically a squawk squawk, but uh, we have changed his name two or three times because uh, the, the big uh, boss people in the birding fraternity have decided that this guy and the ones that look pretty close to exactly the same in Arizona are in fact two different species. And that's, so that's called splitting a bird. And the, so the one in San Diego and Los Angeles and most of California is now the California jay. And the one in Arizona, I think they've named that one Woodhouse's jay or something like that. Uh, and that's not even the first time the poor guy's had his name changed. So uh, when they split them, they of course have to give each one a new name or at least one of them a new name. So, uh, but everybody just still calls them the scrub jay basically. Uh, you can tell when people are from the east because they'll say, oh, there's a blue jay. But the blue jay, if you're from the east, you know it looks very different than this. The eastern blue jay has a big crest and uh, much more uh, a variety of uh, 
the plumage on his head and face and so forth. So this is uh, our, our scrub jay. Uh, basically a very pretty bird, particularly in breeding plumage like he's in here. Uh, one of the most common birds around your house, and I'm sure almost anywhere you live, unless you live in the middle of downtown LA, uh, is this guy, which is the morning dove. Uh, as I note there, he just loves to sit on telephone wires. He's usually the first bird up in the morning sitting on telephone wires. Don't ask me why, but he likes to do that. Um, there probably is no other bird, uh, and I don't know Pasadena that well, so I may very well say something that's wrong, but um, uh, the only other bird that may have a, become established uh, that would look a little bit like this is a new invader into the West, in fact, into the United States, uh, that was introduced from Europe. It's called a, a Eurasian collared dove. He looks a little bit like this, but he's lighter colored and has a ring around the back of his neck, a black ring. So you might see those. You don't want to see those. If you don't see them, that's a good thing because they're not a native bird and they will seem to chase morning doves away. And they're just a little bit more aggressive and so forth. But this is certainly one of the most common birds you'll see. Another one that you may very well have in your yard if you have a single family home or some open space somewhere near you is uh, the Anna's hummingbird. And that is, um, this has been the most common hummingbird probably in all of California, although others appear here and there, uh, particularly in, in the desert and some one migrates through and so forth. But one thing that's happened in just the last 20 years, those of you who maybe know your birds a little bit better, may be familiar with another bird that has a very similar name, the Allen's hummingbird. And the Allen's hummingbird actually came down to San Diego from the Los Angeles area. And it was uh, established that people, bird books that let's say 20 or 30 years ago would call the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the home country for the Allen's hummingbird. And that's where you would see the most you didn't see many south of Orange County, if any. And then suddenly they started showing up in northern San Diego County and then central San Diego County. And now they are increasing numbers rapidly. Anybody, say from the east, that wants to see an Allen's hummingbird, I know right where I can take them to see one with no problem now. So it's an example of a, in this case, it is a native bird and why it started uh, increasing its range so much, particularly to the south. And I'm sure it's now found in Tijuana. I'm sure there's some there too by now. Uh, I'm guessing that they just did so well in the LA area that the youngers got pushed out by the adults that wanted the territory and they had to look for new territory and there was lots of open territory to the south without Allen's hummingbirds in them. So they just started coming down this direction. But an interesting thing, and that's happened with a lot of birds over the last 50 years. Okay, you may have seen these guys wandering around. They're kind of cute and they're the only quail you're apt to see. Uh, anywhere in um, Los Angeles County, uh, you have to go to the desert to see another quail or very high in the mountains. There's a mountain quail if you get up high enough. But down in the, where most people live, uh, this is the main quail around. Uh, they make that call that sometimes is uh, rendered Chicago. I think it sounds more like you Fargo, you Fargo. Um, and they also make a little chip noise uh, when they're just wandering around looking for food. So this is the male and female, a good example of a bird that's a little bit different in plumage for the male and female. And as with all but about three species of birds, uh, the male is the brighter uh, of the two for the simple reason that generally the female sits on the nest and therefore wants to look inconspicuous. And so the more that this female uh, looks like a limb of a tree, the better off she is and her young in the nest are. So, uh, the male is bright because he gets down the ground and he wants any potential predators to see him. Uh, and he'll try and lead them away if the nest is over here, he'll lead them in this direction away from the nest. So that's his job. Uh, a bird that probably is not apt to be around your house because this guy likes big open fields. He loves golf courses, he even loves beach areas. You'll see him on beaches and so on. He just likes the wide open spaces. It's the same as Phoebe. He has a twin, uh, not a twin, but a, a, a close relative that may very well be around your house uh, <clears throat> called the Black Phoebe. And the Black Phoebe, if uh, he's around your house, is easy to spot because he's, uh, these birds are about seven inches long, uh, a little smaller than a robin, but bigger than a sparrow. <laughs> and uh, they, they've acclimatized to uh, people being around, particularly the Black Phoebe. 
uh, when I first came west to live, well, to, came to California to live in 1969, I don't remember seeing many black TVs. And now they are two or three families on every street block, practically in San Diego. And I'm gonna assume they're similar in Pasadena as well, at least I'm, I'm sure there's gotta be a lot there. They're all black over except a white breast and they kind of look like they're wearing a tuxedo. Some people laugh and call them a tuxedo bird because they look like they have a black suit on with just a white breast. And uh, if they're in your neighborhood, they will take over your yard. We have a couple that live in our backyard and we get their permission to go out there. They don't harass us and we don't harass them. They made a nest last year and fledged at least one and maybe two babies. Uh, I threw this in because we should have at least one picture of a endangered bird, and this is the least tern. And I, I know they uh, breed a lot in San Diego in different places. I think they breed in Orange County. I do not know about the coastline in uh, LA County, whether they breed there or not, but they breed strictly on the coastline. And you can see that over tens of thousands of years, they laid eggs like the two you can see there, which look very much like the rocks around them. The rocks even have little black spots of probably granite or quartzite or something on them, which make them look like the eggs. And as you can see, they don't, I don't know if that's supposed to be a nest around them. <laughs> that's the worst nest I've ever seen, but uh, they just rely on the eggs being hidden uh, to protect them. The birds flying over, predators like crows or something uh, would not see those eggs. Unfortunately, in San Diego, their biggest enemy right now are cats, feral cats. And uh, feral cats, of course, don't fly. They just walk right in at night and, or whenever. And uh, they're going after the baby birds. Cats don't eat eggs, but uh, they do eat the baby birds. So, problem there. So here's our friend, the cat, the cat, uh, uh, the cat our, our friend, the crow, excuse me. Uh, the crow does rob nests. He'll rob either eggs or young birds, usually eggs. If he can get the eggs, he uh, is uh, going to go for those. I remember watching a crow, not this one, uh, clean out both morning dove nests around my house. We had two nests. He came in, he knew where they both were. He knew there were eggs in them. And one morning he said, I'm hungry, grabbed two eggs out of one nest, flew right to the other nest, grabbed the other two eggs. And I got really mad at him until I remembered one thing. I had had bird eggs for breakfast myself. So I couldn't get all that mad at him. <laughs> he was just trying to get breakfast. Uh, this is another one of the very common birds around your house, uh, the house finch. And uh, here the female looks exactly like this, except for one little difference. It never has any color on it, it never has any red. And one interesting thing about this bird, uh, those who are maybe familiar with them and have them around their house and have seen dozens if not hundreds of them over time, uh, this bird does have a, what's called a color morph. And instead of being red all over like it is, or where it's colored, it's red, Instead of being red there, it can be yellow or even orange. Now that doesn't happen with many. Uh, the yellow may be one in 50 and the orange maybe one in 100 or something. Uh, but I actually saw one that had all three. It had this color red and it had yellow and it had orange on it in the same areas uh, where you see the red here. So that's very interesting. Uh, and in a bird, that's nothing more than we have the same thing in people. It's like, believe it or not, once upon a time I had brown hair. Some people have blonde hair, some people have black hair. Uh, same kind of thing, it's just a uh, color morph on a, on a given species. But this should be one of your, if there's a big and a small bird on your telephone wire, I'll give you a 99% chance that the big one's a morning dove and the small one's a house finch. Okay, uh, another one is a Cassin's kingbird, another year round bird. Um, it's a little larger bird, it's in the flycatcher family. And kingbirds, I think, I, I haven't found this written out anywhere, but I think they get their name because their favorite place to sit and call is at the very top of a tree, right on the very top. And they'll call there. And this guy has a very interesting call. If you don't think you know many bird calls, this is probably the easiest one. Uh, it just sort of goes, uh, or, or not, I, I can't do bird calls very well. It's just a two note call uh, that it makes. And uh, it makes it all the time. And uh, because it's sitting out where you can see it, it's easy to find. The thresher um, has this big curved bill. It's a long bird. It's about including the lengthy tail there. It's about a foot long at least. And uh, they, they are generally more found in the chaparral, not apt to be in your yard so much, uh, but they like the chaparral or coastal sage scrub mostly. And uh, they have a, a, a long continuous call 
somewhat like a, a mockingbird. If you have an annoying mockingbird in your yard uh, that uh, likes to sing in the spring when it's getting its uh, breeding done, um, this guy does that too, but he's not going to be around your house. But the call is quite different with a little practice, even though they both make a long continued call. The mockingbird repeats things usually three or four times, like tweet, 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 tweet. That's what a mockingbird does. This guy is not so organized. He's not so repetitive. He'll make a long continuous call, but it's more mixed up. He'll go tweet, 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 blah, 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 like that. Not as organized as the mockingbirds. Uh, in the hawk family, uh, probably as in San Diego, your most common hawk by far is going to be a red tail. And the red tail is a little bigger bird than this and, and has a, uh, if you see it from the top, the tail is kind of uh, the color of a brick and underneath it's more of a very pale sort of pinkish. It doesn't have the black and white striped tail that this guy does. And it doesn't have the streaks on the breast. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, red tailed hawk is white underneath and it may have some brown across the top of the breast, I'll speak there. But, um, so it, it's by far the most common, but this guy is the second most common and probably many of you would recognize the red-tailed hawk. So just so you'll know, if you see somebody that's a little smaller, this guy's just a little bit, not a lot smaller than a red tail, uh, but the tail and the color of the breast and so forth identifies him right away as the red-shouldered hawk. And California, oops, went to, uh oh yeah, okay. And uh, woodpeckers, the acorn woodpecker, when I came here, was strictly a mountain bird. I had to go up into the Laguna Mountains above, I'd say above, certainly above 3,000 feet, maybe above 4,000, before you started seeing acorn woodpeckers. Now they're down as low, well-established and breeding every year, as low as 1,500 feet, and I think really 1,000 feet. And uh, we're seeing them, a uh, few even down in the urban area. So this is a good example of a bird that is expanding its territory and uh, does not seem to be mind minded of people all that much. You can see he really likes to hide uh, acorns for the winter. And uh, some uh, college professor, I guess, that found his uh, graduate student goofing off too much, gave him the assignment of saying what the maximum number of holes he could find in one tree for acorn woodpecker at nests. And, uh, not nests, but uh, nuts. And uh, the answer was about 6,000 holes in one tree. Okay, and then the turkey vulture, uh, just an example of the scavenger. These are the guys that you may see on the road. Uh, crows will do get on the road and uh, pick up road kills as well too. But the scavenger, uh, main scavenger is the turkey vulture. Why it's called turkey, I have no idea, but you'll notice he has no feathers on his head. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that because he's picking around in dead food, there could be bacteria or whatever in the dead food and that would get caught in his feathers. And birds like their feathers to be clean. That's why you see birds preening so much. And he doesn't want to have to pree. So over time, he has just evolved to have no feathers at all on his head. And that takes care of having dirty feathers and a dirty neck that he has to worry about. Uh, guess what I'm doing? I'm now punching the down button and it's working perfectly. Uh, I hate computers. Uh, OK, uh, this bird is a winter visitor. Now it leaves, it leaves in late April, usually by late April, they're all gone, June, early May. Uh, cedar waxwing is one of the prettier birds, very nice. It doesn't change its plumage much from winter to summer. So even when it's wintering here, it's got these sharp uh, colors and little bits of red you probably noticed on the end of the wings and on the yellow on the tail. And they just love berries. So if you have a berry tree of any kind in your yard, uh, you might uh, get some uh, cedar waxwings. They stay in small flocks all winter, six to 10. But when it gets to be April and they're ready to start flying north somewhere, uh, I think my record is 130 cedar wax wings in one tree just before they took off for north. This guy uh, has a nice hair. Do I like it? Because it looks kind of like me when I get up in the morning. Uh, this is a Phenopepla. And uh, it's mostly a desert bird, but they're now coming uh, in San Diego County at least closer to. Uh, the uh, mountain areas and, and still not, they still be pretty rare in the city. I don't think I've ever seen one in the city, but they do seem to be moving a little bit west. Where you are, they would certainly be north of the mountains in the Palmdale say, area, that area. I'm almost sure they ought to be there. And probably uh, to the east uh, in the uh, 
Mojave Desert area too, I would think. The males are nice, bright black like this, almost shiny. The females are brownish. And they both show white in the wing when they fly. So uh, just our, I'll show you our two most popular winter visitors. This bird is probably by far the most common winter visitor. If you're a beginning birder, you may think you've never seen one, but I will absolutely guarantee you, you have seen one. You just didn't know you were looking at it. This is the yellow rumped warbler. You can't see it in this picture, but the nice thing about him is that he has a yellow rump. And since most birds, if you shoo them off or scare them off, uh, they're gonna be flying away from you. This guy's very accommodating because when he flies off, you're gonna see that bright red square patch right at the base of his tail. Uh, plus this is the male and he has a lot more yellow on than the female, as is usually the case, does not have that much yellow, doesn't have the black on the breast and so forth. But he's by far, I would guess that in San Diego County, there certainly is 10,000 of these in the winter and I would guess 100,000 probably. And the same would be true for Los Angeles County. By the way, another thing, uh, for two counties that don't think that highly of each other sometimes, uh, Los Angeles and San Diego also have almost exactly the same land area. But you do have four times more people than we do. Uh, so I just threw this in. These are both winter visitors. Uh, but the ones in the foreground are white crowned sparrows, and they're the second most common bird. Not uh, probably not even a half as many of these as the uh, yellow roofed warblers, but still an awful lot of these. If you're in any city park, large city park, and you see a whole bunch of birds feeding on the ground, a good chance that some of them at least will be white crowned sparrows. The birds in the background are Lawrence's goldfinches, and um, these are rare in San Diego County in the winter, uh, at least uncommon, uh, between uncommon and rare. Uh, I don't know about Los Angeles County. They may be more common there, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, but uh, we do have a much more common species, and I'm sure it's more common up where you are as well, and that's the lesser goldfinch. And the lesser goldfinch would not have a black head like that, and it would have uh, not quite as bright yellow and not as much white in the wing, so it would look noticeably different than these guys, but mainly I wouldn't have a, the black on the head. And then uh, lastly, the spring migrants, uh, and we have lots of those. And I'll show you mostly land birds um, for two reasons. You live on the land, you don't live in the water. But we get uh, both San Diego and the LA area, Orange County, uh, get a lot of wintering shorebirds and waterbirds, lots of them. And they're kind of, some of them, for, particularly for a beginner, are really hard to tell apart, some of them. So I've got mostly land birds here. Uh, so this is the black-headed grosbeak. Most of these birds start arriving in uh, well, I used to say early April, but because of climate change and being warmer and so forth and warmer uh, further south and whatever uh, down here, uh, wherever they're coming from, uh, they know that it's now warmer in late March and they're showing up in March. The earliest migrant, I don't have a picture of any in this slideshow, are swallows. And I used to say the swallows arrive uh, early March, but some will be here by the last week or last two weeks in February. Now uh, we're seeing them in early February. In fact, I've seen one that I don't think usually winters here, Northern Rumpwind Swallow. I don't think it's a common winning bird. And I just saw a whole bunch of them the other day. So uh, and birds, we know birds in San Diego, and I'm sure it's true in Los Angeles. Some birds that didn't winter here are now wintering here just because it's warmer. As I mentioned, this guy, if you have a seed feeder, this guy loves seeds, big seeds. So it's like that big bill, that's why it's called a gross beak. He has a huge bill and he uses it for cracking open nuts. Western tanager, uh, probably one of our prettiest birds around. And it is a uh, uh, spring and fall migrant. I threw it into this bunch of breeding birds because it does breed in the mountains. And uh, you would probably have to go up to, I'm gonna say between three and 5,000 feet in your mountains up there, uh, and I'm sure you would find these nesting somewhere. I'm guessing they would nest around Big Bear Lake, for example. And a uh, hummingbird that comes in to nest, the most common one that arrives, at least in San Diego, just to nest, and it's not here at this time of year at all, is black-chinned hummingbird. And uh, enjoys our flower bring, uh, breeds here. And I th and this one I threw in the map just to show you, you can get bird books that will show you the wintering and breeding territory 
And so on this map, the blue area in Mexico, that's where it's coming from, that's its wintering territory. And the yellow areas are where it breeds. So this guy is fairly widespread throughout Western United States, but it does get as far east as Eastern Texas. And by the way, uh, this uh, Sibley's new buck that I showed you earlier, the big one here, the new one, uh, one thing it notes in there that I just mentioned briefly, and he's got a little longer explanation. Uh, on this guy, uh, if you're familiar with Anna's hummingbird, you know, sometimes when you look at a ham, ham, <coughs> Anna's hummingbird, and you, or you look at this guy, they're not iridescent. The whole where it's, he's purple here, black chin, uh, but he's purple in the neck. It's not purple, it's going to look black, and so on, and it's going to look all black. The reason is these feathers are not colored. These birds do not have colored feathers. They get that color from the uh, refraction of light on their on uh, the feathers that they do have. But it's just like, uh, I can't think of anything, some gemstone or something, you hold it up to the light and it will iridesce and so forth. That's what their feathers are doing. And any bird, this one, or particularly the Anna's hummingbird that you're probably familiar with, when it iridescent, it's usually red, but sometimes only pink. And if you've watched them a lot, you may notice that occasionally it will iridesce sort of a gold color, a yellow or gold color. Um, just, I'm not, I can't take the time to try and go into why, but again, it's uh, the uh, uh, refracting of the light. But <clears throat> uh, any bird, there's a rough rule of thumb, any bird that can iridesce one color can iridesce at least two. And if you've watched ducks very much, you may notice that some ducks will iridesce green and purple on their head and neck area. And that's just more of the same principle. And another pretty bird, uh, both here and I'm sure in Orange County, is the hooded oriole. It likes to nest in palm trees. And so it used to be found 200 years ago, before even I got here. Uh, it uh, would only be found in the desert. The people, of course, have planted lots of palm trees around their houses in Southern California. And it will take over these uh, trees for nesting areas too, those palm trees. Problem? Yeah, there's one other bird that's introduced and is a pain, and that's the European starling. And the European starling also likes to make nests in palm trees and it's more aggressive and it's sort of chasing the hooded orioles out. So far, we don't notice any significant decrease in their numbers, but um, if there weren't starlings, they, they'd be a lot happier bird. And, oh, I lied a minute ago. Sorry, I lie a lot when I'm talking about birds. Uh, this is a swallow. This is the violet green swallow. And it's another one that both migrates through in large numbers heading further north. This bird can be found all the way up to Alaska breeding, uh, but it will also breed in our mountains uh, in fair numbers here too. So uh, it's a fairly common swallow, but a lot of people don't see them because they don't nest in the middle of suburban areas or downtown and so forth. So, uh, but it's a fairly common bird. The next time you're up in the mountain, if you're up in the mountains, say in May or June, look up in the sky for a swallow flying around, there's a good chance at that elevation. 5,000 feet or something, good chance it will be a, a violet green swallow. They're a very pretty bird. And then uh, a, a larger flycatcher, this guy's about seven inches or long, as throated flycatcher, another migrant, not here right now at all, but he'll come again in April or so. He will respond to nest boxes, but he likes them high up in a tree. So if you happen to have a, a tree in your yard, and particularly if you're near, say, a canyon where there are larger trees, because he likes to work in the trees and pick up bugs. But if you've got a large tree in your own yard and there are other big trees nearby, you could try putting up a, a birdhouse with a hole, not more than probably an inch and a half in diameter or so. And, um, and put, you have to put it way up in the tree, I'd say at least you'll need a step ladder uh, and maybe a, a fire engine to get it up there high enough, but uh, they, they will breed in your yard. And so uh, the last, uh, next to last slide, uh, this is just a few of the other birds. Uh, I could put a 50 more birds on here, many of them colorful and so forth. One of my favorites is the lazuli bunting. Um, as you probably know, if any of you are artists, there's a color called lazuli. I don't know if it's exactly the same color. But that color on this guy's head, I don't know this particular sort of light blue, but it, there's something more than just being light blue to it. It's just, to me, a really pretty color. And uh, this is the only bird I know that, that has that particular blue color on it. It's a bird in San Diego, probably LA as well, that's found in the lower mountainous areas, uh, usually where chaparral and uh, other trees, larger trees are starting to meet together and uh, probably near, near a stream is where to look for these guys. And then the night heron, black-rounded night heron is one of the most common egrets. Uh, you probably have seen 
this guy somewhere at San Diego, at least he's at almost all smaller reservoirs and places like that. I find them very good fishermen. And so one final picture, just to show you that there are nutty birders around who will go anywhere. This crazy guy went to Australia in 1980 and several times since and uh, had brown hair at the time, uh, but he uh, encountered uh, the Australian a parrot family. The Australian parrot family probably has a hundred kinds of parrots in it, and they're almost all incredibly colorful. So the crimson rosellas are one of the best. And as you can see, they're incredibly shy and uh, will not really want anything more out of you than your entire sandwich. So <laughs> uh, if you're ever in Australia, I'm sure you'll see these. I've seen them in downtown Sydney, Australia. So just uh, to end with a reminder that birds are Interesting worldwide. I've been on all seven continents birding. I have a slideshow on Antarctica, uh, by the way, uh, birding there and just seeing the place. So uh, again, we will use the time as promised. Uh, I'm five minutes late stopping, but uh, if, well, I guess uh, you'll have to uh, unmute, unmute everybody. <laughs> and uh, I will go back to where you can see me. I think I will, yes. Um, I don't know what's on your screen. What's on my screen is what I call the worksheet, but you may. Yeah, I need to, uh, oops. Uh, there, let me, there you go. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. All right. So um, let's see, I will make it so that people can unmute themselves. So uh, for the first off, just thank you for the first part of your presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but you're still with us for a while, so that was yeah fantastic. You, you, you can see why I said I could keep going till midnight, but I try and restrain myself. <laughs> I can keep looking at birds till midnight, so uh, we'll we'll both have to stop. Um, so so far, just one question had come across um, on the chat, which was, um, "Are black phoebes an invasive species?" That's a good question. I would not use the word invasive, um, but I don't know what, in, invasive is usually used at least in, in its birding sense. It's used to mean, it kind of has a negative context to it, invasive bird is one that's Where is my... and, and usually doing something you don't want it to do, taking territory, uh, taking out nest sites from other birds or something like that, and it's come in and it's often also implied that it's probably come in because of human activities, or leaving, leaving food out or garbage out or whatever that's attracting it. So it has a negative context to it. The, the black phoebe, it's, it's not doing anything. It's a very friendly bird. I don't know that it has any competition uh, with other birds at all, even though they're now very common and so forth. So it's, uh, <laughs> while we can be very anthropomorphic about it, call it a good bird. Uh, it's, it's just spreading. I, I would just use the phrase, it's just spreading its territory. Okay, uh, Constance has her hand raised. Constance, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, um, I, uh, I'm visually impaired, so I'm still getting a lot out of this. But uh, you mentioned the house finch, uh, I believe it's called house finch. There's a bird around here, I call it the area robin, I'm here in Pasadena, and it has a real trill, you know, and uh, it's very common, and I but I've noticed that it leaves around um, July, and it about the time the starlings come through, and then it comes back anywhere from October to December. And I don't know if you know which one I mean. Would that be the house finch? Well, let me give you a very bad imitation of what a house finch sounds like. As you said. It's a very long continuing call but with quite a bit of variability into it. So it sounds sort of like sort of like that. It just goes on and on. Is that what you're hearing? Uh kind of like that. It's very pretty. It's it's like uh yeah, it's like a um a lot of warbling, a lot of to you know warbling in it and it's very common. Yeah, okay. Well it, well certainly uh house is very common. And let me put it this way. Uh, certainly where I live, I'm guessing if you live in a normal residential area with uh, single family homes and so forth in Pasadena, um, there's no other bird around that's going to look quite like that. Um, and anything named Robin has solid color on the front. It doesn't have streaks, red streaks and so forth. So, so it's pretty, it's solid colored? 
No, I'm saying a, a house finch is never a solid color. It has streaks, but a real robin uh, will always have a solid reddish breast. Red breast. No, I know this robin, is not a robin, okay. but I call it the area robin because it's so common, at least about 10 months of the year. But I've noticed it's coming back earlier in recent years. It seems to go south or it seems to go somewhere for about okay, well, three months and come back. You're asking a lot of very good questions. One possible reason that you it disappears is that the house finch, along with a lot of other birds, including morning doves, you have far more of them in the winter than you do in the summer. And the reason is that well, the <laughs> ones that live farther north, maybe in Washington state or somewhere, it may get too cold or more likely it just doesn't have a good enough food supply. So they'll fly south. So, so we do get migrants of birds like house finches and morning doves. Uh, the population at least doubles. And you may just live in an area where for whatever reason there aren't year round house finches. And so you see them disappearing to go breed in the summer and then they come back in the fall. So that's just off the top of my head that if, uh, if the birds you have looked like what I showed as a house finch, they're house finches. <laughs> All right, well, we have a bunch more questions. This is a, a chatty group. Um, so one of them is, is there a way to have a bird feeder and not attract the raptors? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I suspect the short answer to that is no. Uh, raptors, and by raptors, if you're not familiar with the term, that's meat-eating birds, such as hawks, eagles, and also owls, uh, and anything of that kind of nature. And none of them go to bird feeders to get bird food, but they may come in and uh, take birds. And if you have a problem with a hawk-like bird coming into your yard and pulling off a bird, what you've got there is almost certainly a Cooper's hawk, because Cooper's hawks are year-round here, and I'm sure in LA as well. And they their main diet is other birds. <laughs> and, and nobody has figured out uh, a kind way to get rid of them. <laughs> Is not what the that's right. them. But, uh, but there aren't a huge number of them. I mean, that's the way they make their living, just like the crow will steal bird's eggs. And uh, the, the hawks will, uh, particularly the Cooper's hawk in particular, will take. Uh, uh, Our crows uh, take care of the local hawks. They're the ones that chase them away. We well, you know who else chases them away. Uh, if you have a mockingbird and you curse it for chirping all night long, it is the most the good defensive bird you have in your neighborhood. I, I have seen them absolutely harass a crow until it just leaves the whole neighborhood. And they will go after hawks the same way. And they're smart enough to always know to go after it from behind because it knows the hawk is slower in the way a hawk can turn fast up and chase it. So uh, they can get right up on it. And peck it I've actually seen them pecking uh, a crow's head. So we have a question. Um, when do night Her parents name. breed? And I, I don't know whether the when refers to day or night or whether it refers to what part of the point. year, but I'm guessing what part of the year. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, first, the, the night yeah. heron refers yeah. to when you see them oh. because they do feed oh, in the night. Actually, hold on. If I can ask everyone to mute their microphones unless they are specifically speaking. Hello. Uh, um, yeah, so um, I'm going to, I'm actually just going to go ahead and mute everyone and then Phil, you'll need to unmute yourself again. Oh. Um, okay. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself, Phil. Yeah, yeah. okay. Because okay. when there's a, there, when, when uh, microphones are open, we start hearing a lot of, a uh, lot of additional chat. So, um, no, but, all right, can... night herons. Yeah, I would just say continue to put your hand up or something so Annie can see yeah. you because she'll that she'll pick up who it is and unmute you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the night herons they they breed in the spring. Uh, this year there's a lake near where I live. I guess none of you would be familiar with Linda Lake, and it seems to be a favorite place for night her black crowned night herons. And then we had young of those. And by the way, that's a good uh, bird where uh, the young looks nothing like the adult. Uh, if you remember the adult, it was sort of gray and blackish and had feathers on its head and all that. The young uh, is brown and light colored streaking up and down all over the place. It looks nothing like the adult. Uh, so it's a good example of a, a bird in which the young is very, very different looking. But it, it breed, breeds in the spring like it's a year-round bird like most year-round birds. But here's a generalization for you. 
the year-round birds that live in your area in San Diego year-round tend to start breeding much earlier than the ones that migrate in. And very often, things like the Anna's hummingbirds are probably breeding somewhere already, quite possibly. And some others are acting like they're starting to be territorial. The, the breeding birds, as I said, except for swallows, most of them don't get here till at least sometime in March. So they don't start breeding till April. So they, the, the two sets of birds may very well use the two territories and not care at all because the local birds are done, except for morning just they, <laughs> they nest and nest and nest and nest. Uh, but the others are, are done nesting by the time the migrants arrive. Um, so any thoughts about the value of the iBird app? Oh, yeah, uh, the, the person is asking about apps for your cell phone. And uh, iBird is one of the most common. Uh, there's one called eBird Pro, which is the one I have, and, but there are several others. I, I teach an introductory birding course, and I go through them there, and I have a lot more time there than I do here. But uh, if you go to, uh, well, it just uh, I probably I, what you can do if you have a computer and are on the internet, just Google um, uh, apps, uh, birding apps, probably. <laughs> Uh, and you'll probably get a ton of people advertising birding apps there. Most of them are good, some are better than others. I think the three we've mentioned are two uh, or three of the best, uh, the eBird, the iBird, and uh, there's one from Cornell, I forget what its full name is. So, uh, the Audubon Society, National Audubon makes one also. I've looked at that one and I, it's good, but I think some of the others are just slightly better. But I've seen little things I don't like about all of them. So. Uh, some of them, for example, do a lot more with calls. Uh, one thing I, the one with I have, the iBird Pro that I have, uh, the one thing I don't like about it is that almost all the photos in it were taken in the eastern United States of the birds found across the whole country. All the birders, I guess, that take pictures for these are in the east. And eastern birds and western birds can look, the same species can look somewhat different. So that's my point. <laughs> But they're All good, right, they're, they're so good. I highly recommend them. Yeah. Trimming palm fronds on palm trees, um, sort of, it says at, at one time, is that what's the effect on the birds? Uh, you're taking away the nests of some birds. Um, not too many birds like palm trees, but some definitely do. I already mentioned the, uh, the oriole, hooded oriole likes them. Uh, sometimes uh, house finches like them also. Another introduced bird, the British, uh, or actually all European, uh, house sparrow, which is probably better known as the English sparrow. Uh, males have a black chin on them and so forth. Uh, they will nest in them also. Um, some other birds that, of course, I'm not gonna think of at the moment also like them. There's some bigger birds that like them. I've seen barn owls nest in them too, even though we have in San Diego at least probably three or four times as many barn owl nest boxes up than there are barn owls. Uh, they will also still prefer the natural areas sometimes and nest in the palm trees also. So you are depriving uh, maybe a half dozen species of birds that might use both of those palm trees. Yeah. Okay. If the then palm tree a... is out in the middle of nowhere, uh, I, well, they are a fire hazard too. That has to be taken into account. So, yeah. so um... Joe was saying that uh, back in the 80s and 90s in La Cañada, they'd see a lot of the grosbeaks and lazuli buntings, uh, but they haven't seen any. Are those populations known to be decreasing in Southern California? That's a good question, and I'm a little bothered also. There's one place that I always go because I can always get blue grosbeaks there in the spring, and I can often, not always, but often get the lazuli bunting. And this past spring, and I doubt the pandemic had anything to do with it, I, I did find one or two lazuli buntings there, which is about normal, but I did not see a single blue grosbeak. And that's the first year that ever happened. So I don't know, there may be something going on, but birds where they want to nest, they need food around there for the young. And there has to be a normal amount of food. And so it's been a dry year, they may not breed in a certain area because just because of the dry year, there's no food there. Having said that though, last year it was a well above average rainfall year in San Diego. So I can't blame, I can't use that excuse. So I don't know why we had a shortage of blue growth peaks last year. So I'm very anxious for it to be about two months, three months from now, I'll look out there again and hopefully they'll be back for whatever reason. 
Um, there are, I mean, I, I'll just sort of tag on to that. Um, I remember seeing presentations some time ago through like the Natural History Museum about citizen science when you have, you know, everybody tagging the birds in their backyard. Are, is there a, a, a good website or something where you can log in and see what's been cited and what the difference is over, say, a five, 10 year period? Uh, I'm sure glad you mentioned that because it definitely should be mentioned, particularly for the beginners. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that people are engaging in citizen science, by which it simply means that people are doing some kind of, in the case of bird, bird study, but you could be studying anything, uh, doing some kind of study that is useful to the scientists. But we can get a million amateur birders out in the field, you can't get a million scientists out in the field. So it's really helpful information. And the single largest thing, and this will answer the question you asked, Danny, the largest single thing to become familiar with are Christmas bird counts, particularly for those of you that already do some birding. But even if you don't, you don't know the birds very well, they still like to have you out there because you can keep score, you know, keep record of, of what the people that are more familiar with birds, uh, what they're seeing and how many and so forth. The Christmas bird counts are held every year, uh, the two weeks before Christmas and the week after Christmas, three week period not only all over the United States, but the Christmas bird counts I know have are now being conducted in Central America and I think maybe all over the world. And uh, the very, very popular, uh, I, 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 we have six of them in San Diego County alone. And real quickly what they are, they're a 15 mile diameter circle. Uh, and somebody makes that circle and once you make that circle, you better have done a good job because you can't change it <laughs> because any scientific information has to have a standardized base. And so you have to be getting your data from the same circle every year. You can't get here, 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 and here. No. So you gotta always use that same circle. So the one for San Diego extends, if you're familiar with San Diego, that extends from about where the San Diego River is south all the way to the Mexican border. That's about 15 miles circle in diameter and it extends out into the ocean and you can go out in the boat and count the birds in the ocean as long as you're still within that circle. Uh, most places usually come up with enough people, but it's fun unless it's raining, of course, but you'd be amazed, at least in San Diego, how seldom it has rained on Christmas bird counts. Let's say we have six counts just here. Uh, look into those and to answer the, uh, any question, uh, to Google, just Google any Audubon Society. I, I don't know if I, I'm guessing Pasadena has its own Audubon Society, a certain Pasadena Audubon Society. If there is, just Google that. If not, just Google Los Angeles Audubon Society. I know there's one of them. And then uh, just under it, sub Google Christmas bird count, and you'll get a lot of information. Okay, Sally Curry, you had your hand up? Oh, you have to unmute. There you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is for Phil directly. Um, I'm wondering if you know Rigdon Curry in Carlsbad. He's um, pretty much known all over the country as a birder. He's a lifetime birder. And um, I, if you don't already know him, look him up. It's Rigdon Curry. U-R-R-Y or A-Y? I-E. Oh, and I your relative, Sally? He's my ex-husband. I was married <laughs> for 20 years. And birding <laughs> broke up our marriage. <laughs> Birding broke up our marriage because he never wanted to talk to me. He just wanted to look at birds. And I, I can tell you a long story which we don't have time for, but uh, you're not the only person that has that. I don't know the person personally. He's, I may he's have heard on the National name. Geographic Channel. He, he's really well known. You, you really enjoy him. Okay. And I think your age, I'm pretty sure. Well, let me just mention also for the better birders there, uh, in San Diego, and I'm sure something similar exists in LA, uh, there is a more scientifically or oriented and birders that are much more familiar with all kinds of birds and everything about them uh, in San Diego called the San Diego Field Ornithologists. And I'm betting there's something similar, if not in Pasadena, there's got to be in the whole LA area. I know the LA uh, Natural History Museum is kind of where the main birding activity is centered there. And it is in San Diego too, at the San Diego Natural History Museum. So uh, yeah, but I'll remember the name. Um, okay, question about pelicans. Is the pelican population decreasing? Uh, no. Um, in fact, both species of pelicans have increased hugely in San Diego over the last 20 years. Uh, in the case of the brown pelican, as you may know, it got into trouble because all you bad people in LA were throwing your pesticides out into the ocean. 
And uh, but once we stopped doing that, guess what? They came back. And so they're now not considered, they, they're one of the birds that uh, is a success story and have been taken off the endangered species list. Now the white pelican, we used to have very few. We thought it was lucky if we saw a white pelican in the winter. Now every water body in San Diego has white pelicans. And the main reason is, all, uh, I'm sort of guessing this, but I think everybody has made the same assumption. Those are all the birds that used to winter in the Salton Sea. But the salinity of the Salton Sea is now so high that most of the fish have died out, except for very few hardy ones that are still there, but not nearly enough to feed a thousand hungry pelicans all winter. And uh, so they had to go somewhere else. And some of them may have gone north to lakes around your area, but I think the majority of them have come west and we have the white pelicans now everywhere. So uh, for different reasons, but both happy reasons, well, the second one is not all that happy because um, the, uh, both species of pelicans have just increased hugely in the last, 20 years in San Diego. Okay, around Point, around Point Winemy. I'm sorry. They're up near the base, I think it's Point Winemy. Oh, Point Winemy. Oh, Point Winemy. There's a bunch uh, of them up there. They're on the beach, and then they take off in groups of five, and they skim the water in groups of five back and forth. Oh, okay, so they're skimming the water in a very straight line. Those are brown pelicans. Yeah, they was, pelicans fun, it was fun to watch. Oh yeah, they are. And that's a, here, here I go on to midnight, but this is really important to know. If you've watched those, and Sally surely has, have you noticed how close they are to the water? They're like inches at the most above the water. And if you look at them, pay attention, they follow are following one wave. And if the wave is coming in, they'll come in with it, and then they fly out and pick up another wave and come in with it. That is taking advantage of what I talked about earlier, that airfoil shape of the wings. When they're doing that, they never flap. They never have to flap because just the, what we would think of as a very small amount of wind going over that little wave, that's enough lift to keep that whole flock up in the air. That's amazing to me. And they're just that far above the water because that's where the wind is, that far above the water. And they can do that for 50 miles up the coast and never flap their wings once. Nice. All right, a couple of specific questions about specific birds. Um, have you seen bulbuls in San Diego or juncos? Well, juncos are, well, there's more than one kind of junco, but really only one that's common here. And that's called the uh, black-eyed junco. And they're pretty common. I can find them in San Diego. They're more common in the mountains. At about uh, 4,000 feet in the mountains in San Diego, juncos are pretty common. There is the only other, the other two kinds of junco are in Arizona and Texas. I doubt either of them have been seen here. Now, bulbuls are not a native bird. They're native to South Asia, um, maybe further than that, um, Africa too, I think. They're, they're a different species. Um, they do occur occasionally somewhere, usually in Southern US because they're a tropical bird. Um, the general consensus is that any bulbul you see is probably an escaped cage bird. I don't, well, I shouldn't say this. I don't know if they are, established anywhere they wait a minute yes i do they're established in florida they're established in the miami area of florida there's a one kind of bulbul that's established there west of miami which is most of the country i don't know off the top of my head of any place that they're established but you might see it's certainly possible you might see them somewhere around the los angeles area but i think the experts would pass them off as simply being escapees cage escapees do you have them in uh, outside your house robin <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Robin sees them out of her window. That's where that question came from. Oh, okay. Well, she's <laughs> either lucky or unlucky, whichever way you want to <laughs> look at it. All right. So uh, Joe asks if you're seeing an increase in red whiskered bulbuls. There we go. Um, another bulbul question. I hadn't seen that they were both in the same thing. So. Okay. Well, yeah. Like I say, they're not common anywhere and the experts will tell you well they're all escaped but of course if you got both a male and a female that escaped you could be getting more so uh and you may have a little <laughs> clustered area the person that asked the previous question uh were you seeing the red whiskered or some other kind of bubbles because there are other kinds yes it's the red whiskered it is okay yeah. I, i'm guessing they're established in the la area then but, i think so uh, yeah i think so i okay, i looked yeah. into it so uh, unfortunately, that's not surprising. 
can I well, we, we have a bird in San Diego that has just become established within the last, the last five years. And uh, if it hasn't gotten to Los Angeles, trust me, it's going to get there very, I know it's in Orange County already, and it may be in the southern part of uh, Los Angeles. And that's the munia, the scaly-breasted munia. Yeah, and, Joe, you, know, you wanted to... I just wanted to add that the bulbul is extremely well established in San Gabriel Valley. Oh, okay. So you'll you'll there. We see them every day, La Cañada, Pasadena, Altadena. Uh, they are all over the place. They're beautiful Arboretum. birds. Mm -hmm. Beautiful birds to see. Uh, I know they're invasive, but we never get tired of looking at them or hearing them. They have a wonderful call. Maybe you can tell us all if uh, is there any evidence that they are chasing other birds out or keeping other birds from nesting? Yes, I understand that they are doing that very thing, that uh, that they're considered invasive. Uh, the purists consider them to be junk birds because <laughs> of that, but we we love them. Yeah, well, a lot of birds are, are very pretty and, and, and so forth. And, uh, it's, and, and I don't have any objection to a bird establishing itself someplace new, even if it's human assisted, as long as they're not a problem. Because if they're a problem, it's a problem to native birds, and native birds have enough problems <laughs> as it is uh, with, without uh, somebody else taking over their nest sites and so forth. So, just for that reason. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I'm not saying, you know, buy a shotgun and go out and shoot them either. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, How do you spell it? Uh, the, the last word is just as it sounds, B-U-L, B-U-L. Oh, it's B-U-L, B-U-L. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so question, um, uh, Joyce would uh, love if you could uh, review the difference between the red-shouldered hawk and the red-tailed hawk. Okay. Um, the main difference is that here, I'm going to guess in Los Angeles as well, area. Uh, if you see a large hawk, as they say, making lazy circles in the sky <laughs> like this, uh, the chances are probably at least 70% and maybe higher than that, that it's going to be a red-tailed hawk. It's a common hawk. It's well-established. It's bigger than a lot of other hawks. And so it, uh, it just sort of rules the, the air, even in urban areas, as long as there is some natural area where it can get what it's looking for. The red-tailed hawk is looking for things like brown squirrels, uh, rabbits, things like that, maybe even roof rats, if you got those. I had some of those. Uh, so uh, the chances are, just without knowing anything more about it, just the odds are it's a red-tailed hawk. But it gets its name red tail, and that's a, one of many birds that are slightly misnamed. The tail is not a bright red. The top of the tail is sort of brick colored in a full adult male. The breeding plumage is a pretty brick color, but it can be a lot lighter color than that too. The underside is Oftentimes just looks white, but in breeding season it will have a little bit of a pinkish tint to it. Uh, the, the red shouldered hawk has that very bold black and white tail. And if you're looking at it from behind, that tail will jump out. Now, again, that's the adult. The juvenile red shouldered hawk does not have the black and white bars. And if you see it fly, the um, red shouldered hawk will have a black and white sort of checkerboard pattern on the wings. And the red tail does not have anything like that on the wings. Okay, for the intermediate birders and the beginning birders that want to sound intermediate, here's how you can tell if it's a red tail hawk every time. On the wing, I'll have to think of my arm. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Here are my wing feathers, <laughs> and here's the body of the bird over here. Okay, I hope you can all see me. <laughs> uh, on the leading edge of the wing, so the, the head of the bird is up here, <laughs> top of my arm. Uh, so it's flying this way. Okay. Look in this area, the area on the front of the underside of the wing, immediately near the body, and this will have a black uh, little band. They are not going up and down, but parallel to the edge of the wing, right on the edge of the wing, for about the first four inches or so. All red-tailed hawks, males, juveniles, females, breeding season, not whatever, all have this one little black band on their wing. That's a surefire way to say. And, and sounding really incredible. Uh, oh, that's that's a red-tailed hawk. Didn't you see the black band on the wing? <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, I'm just going to have and two last questions here. Um, one is 
that, uh, let's see, where is it? Um, there was a question about the parrots. Do you have them everywhere like we have them everywhere? And uh, is it a, what's, what's the, you know, myth behind them? <laughs> uh, the, the short answer to the first question is uh, probably not quite as many. Los Angeles, uh, we take over a hat to you as the parrot capital of the West Coast. Uh, but yeah, we have tons of them. Ours behave interestingly. We have, have them in three areas around San Diego. If you're familiar with the city, we have a big bunch in the ocean beach area, right on the ocean. We have a big bunch that seems to circle around from El Cajon south to the Spring Valley inland. And then there's another group somewhere else uh, that isn't quite as big. And the first two, the ocean beach ones, we have both parrots and parakeets. And the one that we seem to specialize here in is uh, called the red, uh, not red masked parakeet, red something. But instead of having a whole red head, it has red spots on its head instead. That's the main difference. And we have a lot of those. Those are well established. The main parrot we have by far is the uh, red crowned parrot. And it sort of dominates the parrot family. But we also have a fair number of black, no, lilac crowned parrots and a fair number of a few others, yellow, some of the ones that are yellow headed and so forth. So, but we don't have nearly as many different species of parrots as Los Angeles has. And I'm guessing uh, the total number of parrots in Los Angeles is several times the number in San Diego. And right now, if people were worried 20 years ago when they first started showing up because it was a real concern that they would really do damage because they like to eat fruit and they might do serious damage to the orange crops and limes and lemon crops in San Diego. But it turns out for whatever reason, they have not been a problem in that regard. So everybody's happy and right now nobody particularly cares about the parents. And they seem to go for the softer fruit. They like, so a lot of the native plants, both LA and here, have uh, don't have hard uh, outsides on the fruit like oranges or grapefruit or something. Good. And they seem to like the ones that they can chew up easier, which are some of the native ones, which uh, it's fine. All right, so just to end off, um, there was a question about binoculars and one of our listeners said, go to the audubon.org uh, website. They have a, a good list of uh, yeah. a good binoculars guide. Okay, uh, let, um, me comment, let me comment on that because to me, this is important. Here's my advice Ooh, and I'll do it as fast as I can. Uh, binoculars are the same as eyeglasses. You may not be if you to need a new pair of eyeglasses, would you order them off the internet or would you go to an eye doctor or an eye shop? My advice to my class is I teach both uh, intermediate class and beginning class. And uh, the thing I say to all of them is never buy binoculars except in a store where you can try them on because they are as individual to your eyes as your seeing reading glasses are. And uh, if you try them on in a store, uh, tell them to give you one of every kind he's got and you'll see the difference. And let me just tell you one quick test to tell if they're a good pair or not. When you're looking at a bird, we'll pretend these are my outside glasses, the reading glasses. You're looking right through the middle of them. You're only using a little bit of the middle layer to look at that bird. In the store, look out the window, look at the store across the street and find a sign that you can read and then move your glasses and make your eye look out the side of the eyeglass and see if it is still just as sharp. In a cheap or poorly made pair of glasses, it will not be. It's not going to be uh, clear on the side, only in the middle. Well, those glasses are probably cheaper. So if you want a cheap pair, that, that's what to do. But uh, if you want a good pair of glasses, that's a, a real good test. And if they pass that test, they're probably going to pass most other tests for being a good pair of glasses. You can get a cheap pair of glasses, a beginner's pair, if you're just beginning, fine. Uh, it's $75. If you want a pair that will pass that test, but it's not the super good kind. And by the way, the really expensive glasses, it's not the glasses. They can mass produce glasses, not magnifying glasses, telescopes, anything. What it is is what they put on it. If you look at the good binoculars, they all are slightly different color, like a brownish color. You can't see it when you look through them, but those are the things they put on to do things. And the really good glasses that might be about, let's say, anywhere from $750 to $2,000. They have miraculous things on glasses that you can look up, say, at near sunset, and you got a bird up in a tree, and you look at it through your a cheap pair of binoculars or almost any pair, it's just going to look gray. It's just going to look gray. You look through it through these glasses with these coatings on them, and the whole tree is far brighter than the outside. It just makes the whole tree lighter, and the color will come right out on the bird. 
that's what you're paying for. And you may want it. If you're a good burger, you may want that. But you're going to probably have to pay over 750 or something. If you can get by without that, you can get a very good pair of glasses for 275 to 375 in that range. And if you're just starting out and say, hey, I just want to know what the bird is on the telephone wire, you can get a starter pair, let's call it, for $75, which will do fine. Great. Uh, Miriam, you had a question? No. Okay, looked like you were waving. Okay, got <laughs> done. All right, so the last bit of that second question was any quick tips for taking photos of birds with iPhones? Specifically, the question was iPhones, but I would just say tips for taking photos of birds. Aside I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of pass on this one because I am not one of those guys that lugs around a telephoto lens three feet long and this big of diameter, no. Uh, I'm not into bird photography. I have tried taking birds on an iPhone and uh, probably because I'm inexperienced and maybe slightly dumb, I've never been able to make it work very well. Uh, so uh, all I can say is find somebody, the next guy you see wandering around with a gigantic lens, ask him those questions. And I'm sure most birders are fairly friendly and uh, they'll probably- Check, check out check out a YouTube how-to video. I'm, I'm yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> I'm sure there's a video for it. <laughs> all right, well, uh, Thank you so much, Phil. That was just really wonderful. Um, I hope that we'll have you back for the Antarctica talk because I really want that one. I'm a penguin person, so yeah. can't, can't wait for Antarctica. Okay, I'm gonna give you a warning right now. There is so much to talk about, about Antarctica that uh, if you can tell people it may go over an hour, that would be great. Okay, we'll give you two hours for Antarctica, okay. <laughs> uh, an, hour, an hour and a half would be fine. No, because as some of you may know, the Shackleton Expedition went the same way that I went. And I hate to give that talk and not talk about the Shackleton Expedition. And that alone is worth at least 15 minutes of talk because it's so fascinating. Well, thank you so much. It's been, it's been insightful and fun and we all have books now to go get out of the library. <laughs> <laughs> So well, the, the last you. book I showed you probably isn't in the library yet. So yeah, okay. Well, we all, you know, we all get our go to our bookstores. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we will yep. see you next time. Yep. Thank Happy you again. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers.